Welcome back. Now in the last video, we talked about kind of who builds the flame and who fans it, who fuels it. And we come to realize that a lot of this is our responsibility. And so this is a perfect segue into the next fundamental of the music business industry, which um, it's a tough one. It's a tough one to swallow because by now you're starting to realize how much you are truly responsible for your own success which is ironic because you're an independent artist. And so in some ways you could say, well, who else is it on, right? And you could feel alone and you could feel like you don't have a team and all these, all these different things. But at the end of the day, to be successful as an indie artist, you have to recognize how much is really on your shoulders, on your plate. And so the more that you know, the more you know how to navigate what's on your plate, the better you'll do. The more success you'll have, the more money you'll make, and that's really where I wanna get you. So this next fundamental is really about what I kind of perceive as the three pillars or, or maybe even three buckets of the music industry. So when we look back at the span of music and how much it's changed over time, a couple of things have always sort of been true, but we can use them as tools to really understand where we're at right now in the music industry. So I wanna identify these buckets and then talk about why it's important for you to understand. So in one bucket, we have sort of the creation bucket. And it's everything that goes into creating music. Now go back in history, 30 years, 40 years, you know, for, for many, many decades, it was nearly impossible to make a record because you simply couldn't afford it. You didn't have the tools for it. You didn't have, uh, whether it's studio or uh, producing equipment or recording equipment, whatever it was, it wasn't tangible, it wasn't available to the average artist simply because the tools weren't there and, they, and or they weren't affordable. So where we are today, and so I'm gonna contrast a lot with historical and, and current, where we are today is that everybody can make music. And it shows, right? If you look on Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer, wherever you're at, wherever you're looking for music, you'll realize that way too many people are making it. Some people that have no business making music are making music. But in history, that didn't seem to happen, or at least if it was happening, we weren't aware of it. So granted, throughout history, there's always been somebody singing and playing an instrument or just straight up singing, you know, next to a campfire, whatever. Today, now we're hearing it, or at least we know it's there. And one of the problems that causes is white noise or just noise in general. So it's harder to be discovered because more people have the ability to create. So on the one hand, when we look at the music industry as it is right now, creativity has never been more accessible to the masses than it is today, right? All the tools are there. Really, you need uh, at minimum a voice and a phone or a voice and a computer or an instrument. I mean, it's the, the, um, the, the needs are minimal because you can create so much with so little. There's so much computing power in a phone these days that you can, I mean, people have filmed feature films, filmed, edited, they've shot entire films, music videos on an iPhone. Um, and it's crazy to think about that because 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we wouldn't have been even thinking that's possible. Today, people are doing it all the time. So creativity in that bucket, it, it makes us as independent artists feel like, okay, so I can do this because I can be creative. I can get my creativity made, right? I can record an album, I can produce a track, and I can do it all on my own if I want. And to some extent, that's true, okay? So we have this creativity bucket, and guess what? It's solved for us, or so we think. Let's move to the next one. So in the next bucket, we have, which I'll gen generically call the distribution bucket. And this is the bucket, again, contrasting with history, even if, you were rich and you could afford to come up with your own album, record your own album, you funded it, self-funded it, all that. How would you get it out there? You know, how would you manufacture physical units? Um, granted, if, if you had an unlimited uh, you know, bank account, sure, you can not only pay for the production, you could pay for duplicating vinyl or cassette or CDs or whatever the medium was at that time. My point was for the masses, that just wasn't available. So you couldn't create it and you couldn't distribute it. You couldn't get it out there. Well, fast forward to today, what happened when we started seeing, hey, there's an ability to make music 
And you know, file sharing, we go back to Napster, and all of a sudden um, iTunes jumps, you know, Apple jumps into the mix and it's like this tech company solving a music problem. I mean, it's a total side note, but how did a tech company become one of the largest businesses in the music industry? Well, it solved the problem, right? So that was uh, accessibility of the music. Now, I don't wanna jump topics, but for this bucket, we're talking about sort of the distribution machine. How do we get it out there? I mean, we have aggregators. I don't remember the first one. It may have been CD Baby, but CD Baby was sure, certainly one of the early ones, but TuneCore, um, DistroKid. Um, I think The Orchard actually, if I'm not mistaken, started as an aggregator and it's grown um, substantially into and morphed into other things. But my point is, is once we realized that we didn't need a record label, as an independent artist, we felt free. Oh my gosh, we can make albums and get them out there? What do we need a label for? What do we need a publisher for? I can do it all. And, and in my mind, when the independent artist community kind of arrived at that mental place, that, that mental uh, stop in the timeline and chronology of, of creativity and everything, I think this is where like the screws maybe started to pop out of the machine or the wheels fell off the car sort of thing. Because there is a third bucket. There's probably more, but generically, again, just trying to be broad here. There's a third bucket and that's connecting with the audience. Let's call it marketing just for simplicity. And when you think about it, there are a lot of companies, a lot of people, a lot of services out there that offer marketing services, offer to connect you with fans. And I think back in the day, I mean, even what, 15, uh, 10, 15 years ago, like thinking about Bandcamp uh, falling into the scene and like, wow, this seems like awesome. You could, or Taxi, remember there's like pitching your songs. I think Taxi's still around. But there are all these services and business that started popping up and like, hey, you can make a record you could distribute a record. You got an aggregator. You got CD Baby. You're up on on uh, iTunes now, or Apple Music, or Spotify, or wherever. And and the feeling, the tendency, and the feeling is okay. Problem solved. But guess what? Look at the average artist, and you're going to realize quickly, very quickly, that they still can't connect with an audience. And there's a handful of things I want to uncover in this segment that the industry doesn't really talk about too much because they don't want you to know. They don't want you to see the problem in its full depth, partly because knowledge is power and they don't wanna hand you that power. Um, but also because the more elusive it is, the more you will seek answers from other people. And so the more you can think for yourself and the more you understand this stuff, the more you, problems you can solve for yourself. So this third bucket, this marketing piece, this connecting with my audience piece, What's it about? How, to, how can we sort of conquer it? Or what can we do to move the meter, right? That's really what we're talking about in this segment. And the first thing I think, like most things in this whole, this whole series of videos, uh, Music Business 101, is really about changing the way you think. When independent artists believe that they, they're really talented at what they are, and maybe that's objectively true and it's been proven. Maybe they have a, a music degree from Yale or Juilliard or wherever, um, or a vocals degree from somewhere. They've taken you know, vocal uh, lessons from the greatest instructor of all time, whatever that is, an objective measurement that, hey, I'm talented. And I've come up with this project, a single, an EP, an album, whatever, I wanna get it out there. But the problem is the eyeballs, the listeners. So a couple of notes to just mix in here because really what I wanna empower you with is the ability to think through the music industry differently to see it through a new lens, to see it in a way where I know how to navigate it now. It's not about memorizing tricks or learning hacks or you gotta use this service to that service. It's more about understanding how the industry really works so that now you're positioned for success and you can adapt and you can adjust because the more you understand, the more you can adjust, okay? So walk with me on a couple of thoughts I wanna pepper, um, pepper you with and then just see. let's see where this lands. The first one is <clears throat> um, quite a few years ago, and it was kind of when uh, I think TuneCore first dropped on the scene. I was just curious. I had a curiosity of, you know, how many people are on and how many people are actually making money? And I did some quick math, and it was based on the number of songs, the number of artists, and the total number of payouts. And really quick, ugly math came to realize that the average artist on, Tune, let's call it TuneCore or CD Baby, whatever it was, was probably generating two to five bucks a year. 
Now fast forward, I think this was probably a good 15 years ago. Fast forward, that number is probably not much different today, if not worse than it was 15 years ago. I mean, there's, there's data, I don't know if you know this, but Spotify has a tool and I think it's called Loud and Clear. And you could actually run different searches on um, like, if I have this many streams, where does this rank me in terms of top percentages or bottom percentages of placement in Spotify? Or how many streams do I need to make this much money? So you can run all kinds of search, uh, search tools. It's a great search tool. Um, the, the link in the, the kind of the description of that tool is in the show notes. Um, but the loud and clear uh, Spotify tool, I ran some searches and, and quickly realized, and you can actually read this in a bunch of different places, but I think it's something like 90% um, of all artists on Spotify have less than 10 songs. And so what it shows you is that the, the vast majority of, on art, of artists on Spotify are not even considered career artists. They may be considered hobbyists or whatever. So if you're an indie artist and you're offended by that, what are you talking about? I've had three albums out. If they're on Spotify, great. You're in that small percentage of artists that have more. But if we're looking at the data, the data tells us that the vast majority of people, even watching this video, don't have even 10 songs on Spotify. Maybe they put up a single, maybe they got to an EP, but then they dropped out or dropped off, or maybe they just ran into financial problems or just struggles where they couldn't get their next project up. And so the point is, is that that space, when you think about the, the uh, millions of songs that are on Spotify, for example, that, that millions of songs is sort of, represented of representative of a big mess of people that have put music out there that distracts the public from hearing or finding you. And now you're competing against noise, really, not other talented artists, you're competing against noise. And also that the vast majority of artists on Spotify, as an example, and I'm sure the same is true on Apple Music and other platforms, is that they're there's an understanding that the vast majority of artists on those aren't on those platforms are not serious about their art. And the way that that's defined is how many singles or how many projects have they put up. And also that the vast majority will never even make a hundred dollars from Spotify, much less a comfortable living. And you could find your own sites. I've, I have a few in the show notes, but you could find your own sites in terms of um, you know, what, what this many streams or this many views or whatever will equate to in terms of income. But keep in mind too, that's income, gro sort of gross income. If you're co-writing and every one of your songs has five writers and there's publishers involved or even independent labels that are involved in helping you offering label services, that hundred bucks may now become two bucks to you because everything just ends up getting chopped down. So if you're truly independent, no one else is involved. You write your own, produce your own, record your own, distribute your own, and use a service that doesn't take a percentage, maybe that hundred bucks is yours. But for the vast majority of indie artists, not even that hundred bucks is theirs. They gotta split it up with people. So when it comes to marketing, it comes to this bucket. The reason why I point this out, and this is so critical for you as an indie artist in wanting to understand success and how to get there, is that there's a belief system that all the tools are already there. That you flip a switch, you can make an album, you flip a switch, you can get it distributed. And you could flip a switch and people will care. But I'm gonna tell you that the vast majority of people don't care. Um, I think I read that uh, Ed Sheeran, I think it's Ed Sheeran is like the most streamed artist of all history, uh, billions, right, of, of streams. And you can go through the numbers and see, well, the irony is, even when you get in your car, if you put on the radio, you hear the same songs over and over. And that's another conversation for another day about why that works and it has to do with public performance royalties. And that's why artists where, um, you know, the songs are being played over and over and over, actually not artists, it's the songwriters and publishers, but uh, another conversation for another day. But the reason why they're played over and over is because even the way that surveying of spins of songs went, you had to get the only way you could calculate enough for it to make sense for a person to do this professionally was when they're listening to this, the audience is listening to the same song over and over. And I know that even that concept may seem a little bit convoluted, but I'm really trying to make the point here is that it's never been more difficult in a way to reach an audience than it is today. 
So the tools to create are there, they're killer, right? There's so many of them. I can create, if I have zero musical skills, I can write and, and record a song and get it out there on Spotify tomorrow. I can. Um, and I've made little tracks despite having, really having a true ability to do that um, because I wanted to learn. But my point is, is that now all those, those boxes are checked, but here's the box that's missing, connecting with an audience that cares, getting that audience to not just show up and listen to one song, but to consistently show up and listen to all your songs and to re-listen. So now they're on playlists and they're streaming over and over and over because that's when the real money's made. Because I know a lot of people, um, if you're even familiar with the, with the book and the concept of the long tail, sort of this economic concept that the money-making properties are sort of up here and it's a relatively narrow line down. And then there's this very long line, what we call the long tail of all these hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of artists or, or even authors really it's in any content context that have written a song or published a song or published a book and they've sold one copy and that's the vast majority as you look out at that long tail it's crazy whole other arguments to be made about maybe that's where the money is if you can gather all that but for you wanting to be on this end of, of the graph you want to be where your numbers are way up here the only way you get way up there is if a lot of people are listening and re-listening, replaying, reviewing. Um, and, you know, your songs are getting picked up in sync opportunities, film and TV, or they become, um, they go viral with, with clips on TikTok or whatever. Wherever it's happening, that's what you want. So the piece that's missing, and my whole point in saying this is the piece that's missing is still that sort of marketing, connecting with the audience, getting an audience to care bucket. And I will challenge you, you name one company that has solved that puzzle. And you're, you may have you know, your favorite because it worked for you, but I'll tell you right now, not even the major labels of the world have solved that problem. They can put out content no one cares about all day long, every day, and then suddenly well, something comes out and everybody cares. And that one funds everything that they missed on all the projects before. And my point here is that the marketing connecting with audience piece and conversation is a piece that not only is still missing and hasn't been solved, lots and lots of great minds are trying to solve it, but it has not been solved. Um, you can see that's evident everywhere in pretty much every intellectual property industry, it has not been solved. Um, my point for you is what can you do to move the meter? And that's where I have a dose of harsh reality for you. Um, and also some good news. You can do something about it. That's the good news. The bad news is, or the dose of reality is that it's on your shoulders. It's on your plate to do something about it. So if you thought being a great artist, a great singer, a great musician is enough, it's not. And you already know this, but here's what I'm telling you. You cannot connect with an audience unless you now become a marketer, a salesperson, a social media personality, or you come into this, this space where you, you start to understand attracting an audience, fostering an audience and building an audience and continuing to grow that audience is a skill set that most indie artists do not have, do not care to develop, think is in some ways pointless, but also think that it's a turnkey solution. You can hire this company, use this app, use this service, pay this fee, uh, pay for a bot to do this with, on that platform, whatever. None of those things solves the problem. So you have to be your own marketer. Now, this is also an argument that'll be made of why artists still sign to labels. Why do they do that when they can own it all? Well, we've talked about owning a piece of a, a whole pie this big is not even close to owning 15% of a pie that big. And so there's also this argument to be made about just sort of what matters more. And I'm not advocating signing to a label and I'm not advocating staying away from them. What I'm advocating is finding what's right for you as an indie artist. And I will question you and challenge you, are you better at attracting an audience than a label? Maybe you are, maybe you're not. And that's part of the question. Labels pitch playlists, labels pitch bloggers, labels pitch even the DSPs themselves. Can you? Do you even know how? Do you even know where to start? Well, this might be the instigator, the fire that gets burning that you're like, oh, I could do that. I could go after that. Well, I'm going to challenge you to do that. If that's something that you want to do, that's what you should be doing if you want to move the meter. But if you're not prepared to, you have to understand having great music 
and having it up on a DSP will literally net you zero. Zero. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm saying it's too tough out there. There's too much competition, too many, uh, too many poor artists and poor songs and bad things out there to distract us. And, that, and that's on top of the fact that that's not even the only thing distracting us. We have all the other social media platforms and, and content types, short form video, dance video, cat video, whatever. It's like all that stuff's pulling at us all the time. So it's never been more difficult to attract attention than it is now. If you as an indie artist are not prepared to learn how to develop interest and attract interest, you will most likely fail. So that's one reason to sign with a label that you believe can do a better job than you. That's also separately and maybe an alternative path is for you to do it all yourself and continue to be independent and do this yourself, but realize, okay, well now I have to develop this other skill set or find people who can or services who can do this so that I don't have to because that missing piece won't magically appear. There's nothing that goes viral that didn't start with an audience showing up and getting attracted. Um, I mean, I've had little test cases where um, you send out a song to uh, 10 people. This first person sends it to three. This second person sends it to zero. And then this 10th person sends it to 10 who send it to another 100 that send it to another 1,000. So this one person led to 15,000 and this one person led to four. And how do you, you know, what's, how do you figure that? How do you crack that code? Well, here's part of it. You can't. And the reason why is because you don't know who's connected to who. You don't know who's an influencer. You don't know who's a tastemaker. And if you're doing your research and you figure out what well, this blogger is or this, um, you know, podcaster is or whatever, great. You're already steps ahead of the average independent artist. But if you're not willing to do that kind of work and think through that lens, you won't be able to connect with the audience. And, and I know there's people out there that will say, keep doing good work. Gary Vaynerchuk, I think, is a great example. I like his messaging a lot. You know, being a good person, being kind to people, being ethical, it's all awesome. But I think, and you know, I'm not Gary Vaynerchuk, obviously, but if he was here, I think what he would say is, look, do what's in your heart and keep doing it. And don't give up. Be consistent and show up and give your best efforts. And eventually, the audience will be there. And I think he's right, but here's the problem. Most people give up long before that audience are actually develops, which means the, the ideology of consistent good work builds an audience over time is true, but it never works out that way simply because we give up before then. So if you're willing to not give up and you can develop that audience by going one step at a time, one fan at a time, until you get to five and then 50 and then 500 and so on, that's great, but that might take you 10 years. And my one of my questions in this part is, are you willing to put in the 10 years to get there? You know, you've heard, um, what's his name, uh, is it Malcolm Gladwell, the whole 10,000 hours concept. You don't become truly a professional at something, or really good at something until you put in 10,000 hours. There's, a, there's more than a handful of things in my life that I've put in way more than 10,000 hours doing repeatedly, day in, day out. Um, there's a lot of things that I dabble in and I haven't. You know, I love to say I could play guitar really well or piano really well, I can't. I don't even know if I put in 10,000 hours in my lifetime. I know for certain I haven't even put in 100 hours in the last year on either of those instruments. So I'm not gonna be that good, that's the reality. So the more time that you put into developing this thing, which we're calling marketing slash connecting with your audience, <clears throat> the more, excuse me, the more likely you are to actually connect with an audience and start to build them and foster them and grow them. And that right there is a huge missing piece for every indie artist out there. That if you understand that and you understand that the missing tool, the, the tool that's missing from your kit is the connecting with audience piece. And if you will put in the time and effort in actually developing a fan base and, an, and a, a, a group of people that care about you, you will be unstoppable. So I'm gonna leave it there. We're gonna jump into the next segment, but I hope that helps you. Uh, again, click the like and subscribe button if you haven't done already. Share this video with a few friends, but don't stop. Continue to the end of this series because I know this thing will be a game changer with you if you will actually listen and implement. All right, go at it.